Ready oh. for this one? The great, long, long time ump, the most games umped ever. Joe West joins us right now on Foul Territory. Joe, great to see you and to have you on here. AJ, why don't you introduce your friend here? The man, the myth, the legend, Joe West. He once threw me out of a spring training game. <laughs> he also once yeah. kicked Mark Burley out for picking him off of first base. Yeah. So here he is, the manager with the all-time game record, Joe West. Joe, how you been? I've been great, you know, and you deserve to get kicked out of that spring training game. It's the way you acted, and, you know, I didn't even – I didn't even say anything to you. I just told Freddie, I said, we need another catcher. This was not playing nice in the sandbox. So <laughs> he sent a catcher out there to replace you, you know, and you didn't want to play anyway. You were getting beat like eight to two. Exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you weren't calling strikes either. So I was like, I'm out of here. I'll be home in 15 minutes. You got three more hours. This crap. Yeah, that was, that was exactly what happened. The ball was low. And you said, I, I got to have that pitch. I said, the ball's low. He said, I, you said, I don't care. I got to have that pitch. We're getting killed. <laughs> what was he wrong? Well, I, I, I look at this. I, I look down. I see Brock. You know, I kicked Brock out of one game, too. It was a long time ago. Yeah, you first, got me once, Joe. Yeah, you got me started. once. I'm, surpri I'm surprised it wasn't more than that, but. Yeah, well, I was, too, but. <laughs> well, you didn't get Kratz? Joe, you didn't get Kratz? I never played. Oh, okay. No, he, he he was when he came in, he was the nicest kid that ever lived. He was he was like he was happy to be there and it was a pleasure to have him there. Wow. You know, he, wow. he wasn't he wasn't grumpy like you, AJ. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I had a plan. You know, you get, you get in there once a week. You got all your yeah. energy, you got all your positives stored up. When you get out there every day, it wears on you. <laughs> Joe, how it was fifty six what is it, fifty six forty? How many games? Uh, no, it's 54 60 regular season games. Okay, and, then, and they're making a movie, correct? About your. Oh, no, I hope I hope not. Because <laughs> <laughs> the guy, what, what's the guy's name? There was a guy that's called me to try to get me to do an interview about you and all the games you caught. What, what was the guy's name? If, well, there, there was a, a producer out there named Charlie Men that's trying to put this together, but uh, I, don't, I don't think he has enough money to put it together because. Uh, oh. You you can't you can't have a uh, a documentary and not have any footage and I don't think he can afford the footage and I'm certainly not going to ask baseball for the footage <laughs> so but uh, yeah um, it, it was uh, I worked uh, 5460 games regular season and I, the, the funny thing is and you don't look back on this too much but I had 135 postseason and all-star games. And so the, the real number, I think, is 55-95, if my math's correct. But, uh, yeah, and um, I think Jerry Davis has just a couple more games than I did postseason, but he's he's still about three or 400 behind me in the regular season games. And um, he was he was quite the umpire himself. He was, uh, he was around for a long time. In fact, I worked his last game in St. Louis, when uh, when he worked his last game that he ever worked was in St. Louis, so uh, but it was a, it was a heck of a career. And I was I was very lucky. I got I got in it at a young age. My first game I was like twenty three years old in the big leagues, and uh, that doesn't happen. They don't they don't take people like like that anymore. I I think they took me to the big leagues that year because I had worked spring training, and uh, so they gave me like eight games at the end of the year. So I worked those eight games, and then I went to Puerto Rico. <laughs> so, but uh, I, I was very lucky. I was I got in at a good time, and I didn't get hurt. Uh, I did have three knee surgeries. In fact, the last one was a knee replacement, and I worked one year on that replaced knee. So, um, I, again, I was I was very lucky. I I was healthy. I got through it, uh, and uh, and I even. Even made up with Hall Carrollson after throwing Mark Burley out of the game. So oh, we're, oh, we're going to get to that. Don't you worry. We're getting into that here in a second. Don't you, we got video and everything. Kraft has some stuff for you first. Oh, okay. Sure. What, uh, what, when, when you said you broke in at 23, were you like, I'm going to do this for the next 233 years? Like, <laughs> this is how long, like, what was, what was your, what was your mindset there? It, at 23, 24, starting the next season, like, are you like, yeah, I'm going to get it. I'm going to do this for 
X amount of years, and then I'm going to go do my singing career. You know, it's really funny. When, when I first started, I thought I'd work 20 years and get out. But uh, when uh, I worked my 22nd year, they fired 22 of us. And um, we beat them in court, all but four of us, I think. We beat them in court, got back pay and uh, all the benefits retroactive. And um, in fact, uh, it says it says that they negotiated and brought these guys back. That wasn't true. The federal judge put us back to work because what they had done was outside the, the law. And uh, so that and that's why we got uh, back pay with interest. But uh, so a lot of those guys that I was working with, Terry Tata, Drew Coble was in the American League at the time and uh, Frank Pulley. Uh, with the, I mean, they fired a lot of good umpires. They fired 365 years of experience and replaced it with two. And that's why a couple of years there that they were struggling a little bit with. In fact, they went to the ball clubs and asked you guys not to argue with them. But uh, and this was like 2000, 2001. But um, I, like I said, I was very lucky. And all those guys retired and took the pension and the, the severance money and and I said, well, as bad as you treated me, I'm just going to aggravate you for a couple more years. So I'd given them 22 of the best years of my life. So I decided to give them 20 of the worst years of my life. So, <laughs> what, what, wait, whoa, whoa. Why'd you pick the 20 years when I was around? I wanted to see the nice Joe West. I got the mean, grumpy old Joe West. So I was, here, here's I was my... kind of grumpy in my old days, wasn't I? <laughs> We have the video of you throwing out Mark Burley. The only time I think Mark Burley ever got kicked out of a game was in Cleveland. There's been some ruckus today in Cleveland. We're also going to ask you about with some replay stuff. So can we roll the video of you throwing out Mark Burley in Cleveland? Here it, it is. is. So he picked Joe West off and whoever. Uh, yeah, why are you yelling at Mark? Mark Mark never said a word to I, anybody. I didn't yell at Mark. I was yelling at Ozzy. Okay. Don't, don't come, come out here. Now, don't come out here. You know Ozzy's coming out and putting on a show. You're yeah. putting on a show. He's putting on a show. Then we get Hawk saying, Joe, it's time for you to go home. Yeah. Right? So you throw Ozzy out of the game, fine. Joey Cora then has to manage our, our poor team. Don Cooper gets kicked <laughs> out, our pitching coach. No, he didn't. Then you, get, didn't then get you put Angel Hernandez in the middle, Joe. Come on, out of all the people. He was a peacemaker. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what they called him? <laughs> yeah, he was a peacemaker there. So that was fine. I get it. Yeah. The next time we played Burley's pitching, you're umpiring. Angels behind the plate. I think you were at second base. We told no, I Mark. Was at, I was at third. Okay, we told Mark, do not throw over to first this entire game. He's why not? That's part of what I do. I said because Angel Hernandez is going to call a balk on you the first time you throw over to make sure that Joe West was right when he ejected you. <laughs> and Burley's like, no way. He threw over balk right away. <laughs> Soon as he went over balk, he gave yeah. the worst move you've ever seen. He, Straight over to first. Fuck! And we're like, we told you not to throw over. He's like, I just had to try it. <laughs> it premeditated. But the balk. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Yeah, bullshit. Yeah, they Joe. they they talked about that in the umpire room before the game. They did. Were you in you Cleveland did. then? Yeah, y'all did. No, when you said, hey, no, no, when Angel hey, called he, the balk on Burley. Off. And let me and let me tell you something. No one wants to kick Mark Burley out of the game when he threw the glove up in the air. The other three umpires went, no. Because, I mean, he pitched quick. You know, everybody loved to have Mark Burley in the game. When he threw the glove up in the air, they all went, oh, no. You know, so, and then, uh, of course, I I said, if it comes down, you're gone. And he, and it was. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, Hawk took some shots at me after that one. So, but that was, that was funny, you know. And he beat up, you know, when you boys won the World Series in 2005, Hawk used to say that I was the best umpire in baseball. When I called a balk on Mark Burley, I was the worst. <laughs> so, <laughs> you were. Because, oh, because Burley, Burley was his favorite player. So that's uh, – and then um, there was a time – it was a few years later. I missed the first 19 games of the season because I had throat surgery. I had, uh, I had radiation for throat cancer. and I missed the first 19 games of the season. I came back and – I think Hawk was working with Steve Stone, and uh, he said, uh, "Steve said uh, this is Joe's first game back." 
And the hawk said, what was he doing? And he said, well, he had throat cancer and he had radiation treatments. And so the game ended and he kicked in our door, came right in the shower and said, look, you can fight me. You can hate me. You can screw me. You can do whatever. But don't you ever die on me, you son of a bitch. <laughs> 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 so from then on, I'd get calls, hey, we're playing over in Winter Haven. We're playing over in Orlando. We're playing at, uh, uh, what is that place he plays? Uh, it's real tight. Uh, Orange Tree. Orange Tree. Yeah, he, he'd call me up. And I, you know, I know why he'd call me because he needed somebody with a big handicap. <laughs> so, but uh, he was something else. He, and still is something else. Quite the, quite the guy. He's kind of cute, you know, so. But, All right, uh, Joe. Joe, Joe, you've been out for a few years now. Um, we've got some. We've got some rule changes in the game. Um, I want to hear from an umpire's point of view of of, of what you kind of think of these new rules. The pitch clock. Um, you know, we've got talks of robo umps. I'm sure you love that idea. Um, and then, you know, how we were talking earlier on the show about foreign substances and how these guys are checking for foreign substances and. We don't understand, you know, you touch a hand, a hand's going to be sticky. A pitcher's using rosin, sunscreen, whatever they're using. How can we yeah. How can we tell what, what's going on, what's being used, what's illegal, what's not illegal? Um, just get some, some of your thoughts on some of the newer rules. Well, the, big, the biggest problem with checking their hands, I mean, when I first came to the big leagues, the, the hitters wanted the pitchers to be able to control the ball. And they wanted them to have a good grip on the ball because they knew where it was going. Um, and so the, the pitchers back then, uh, there was, there was not this great importance of checking the pitcher to see if he had a foreign substance because they wanted him to be sure he held the ball. Well, with the advent of all this technical stuff and spin ratio and all this stuff, uh, it's gotten to be where it's out of hand and you've opened up a can of worms where they're going to be people that are hit with a pitch that the pitcher just lost control of the ball. And uh, so in some ways, it, it may be good to have changed all that, but in some ways it's bad because you're going to have some people get hurt because they can't grip the pitch. Um, the, uh, the issue about checking them uh, is, is basically to keep them from cheating. And uh, when there was one guy, I forget who it was, said it, it ruined his pitching mechanics because he, he can't doctor the ball anymore. Well, why would you make a statement like that? Even even if you were doing it, why why would you say something like that? I think the the history of baseball is the biggest thing about it was uh, that everyone's trying to be the best that they can be, and I don't think any of these people, except the guys that were throwing spitballs like Gaylord Perry and the guys that scuffed the ball like Don Sutton, uh, I consider that more cheating than keeping something on your hand where you can control the pitch and and know where it's going. Uh, so I have a, I have mixed emotions about doing all that because I would rather the pitcher know, knows where he's going to throw the ball than to have somebody get hit in the face because the pitcher lost control of the ball. Uh, the other issues about the rule changes, uh, I think the size of the base will probably help the first baseman. It should help the base stealer. And it should help you in turning a double play at second base because the base is bigger. Um, and then uh, things like that, I, I think they've done that more for a safety reason than they have for anything else. I don't, I don't think the powers that be were smart enough to realize that you add a couple, three inches here or there, you're going to increase anything to improve the, the game. But uh, I don't have a problem with that. What I, I do have a problem with, and I've always had this problem, is the time between innings where when I when I first started there was there was no time between innings. You got out there and you pitched and you, you were ready to go. So it was about the early eighties, they decided to put in a, a time between innings at a minute and forty seconds. And uh, we had four pitchers that complained about it. One of them was Steve Carlton, one of them was Tom Seaver. One of them was Randy Jones, and I forget who the fourth one was, but they complained that a minute and 40 seconds between innings for commercial times was too long, that they'd be waiting on the mound when, you know, it was time to play. 
Then they went to two minutes and five seconds. And then about 16 or 17 pitchers complained that it was too long. And now, especially in the playoffs, it's almost three minutes between it. So the idea of speeding up the game, making you get in the box and doing this and the other, uh, we're wasting probably 18 minutes doing TV commercials. So they haven't addressed the real problem, which is the media. And, uh, and, and I don't mean it, the media itself. I mean the commercial time between innings. And uh, I remember in the middle eighties, there was this thing that the Mets used to do where they had the walk up music and they, they wouldn't leave the on deck circle until they'd played their walk up music. And it was almost like they were auditioning for a Broadway play. And that became the thing to do was to wait till your walk up music was. And um, that slows down the game. And, that, and yeah, that's quit just... complaining. Hey, quit complaining because those damn commercials paid your fat ass salary that you got <laughs> for 40 years. So I don't want to hear you listen, complain about the walk, the walk up music, listen, the, the, the time you between. Know, because listen, if there was no commercials, Throw them out, Joe. Golf, not at Bella Kalina. You can be at, <laughs> at Diamond Players Club still. So don't give me that crap about it took too long. Listen, listen. All the money you made, all the money you stole from the White Sox, <laughs> 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 and you're talking about the money that an umpire made. I mean, you made more money in uh, two months than I made in a year. Well, <laughs> so, should have had a better union head. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I wasn't too good at that either. <laughs> I, well, <laughs> At one, t- at one time, I had us in the Teamsters. Now, you'll like this story. I had both the major and minor league union in the Teamsters. And both unions turned it down. They said, no, we want our anonymity. I said, well, let's, let me get this straight. If you go on strike, there's going to be 68 of you walking a picket line. If you go on strike with the Teamsters, they will shut down the ballparks. <laughs> yeah. Joe, you, you would have been like Jimmy Hoffa. You would have yeah, disappeared. Well, yeah, I would have been under one of these new stadiums they built. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you want to ask the fan question? Well, no, I was going to let Kratzy. Kratzy okay, had something Kratzy, for him. you go first, and then AJ's fine. No, wait, I'm, I'm a high school coach now, so I'm ruining kids' high school careers. But I want to know, we have a – I have a video here for you, and I want you to tell me if my guy is doing something, if he's good or not, because we have a – we don't have enough umpires in high school and we need new ones. So we need young people to get into umpiring. Let me know how the guy's doing here. But also yeah. I want to know more. So is even picks his, even picks his butt too. So he's, he's got <laughs> the <it>. true ump. <laughs> but how can, how can we get younger people into umpiring so that we got them in these games? Well, that kid right there should be pretty good on the low pitch. And, uh, <laughs> For, for the most part, uh, it, it's pretty much like everything else. The, the people that are, are working high school and, and Babe Ruth games and all, they're getting chastised by the fans and everything, and, they, and they're really brutal. They don't really realize that uh, that the, most of this is, is just like a avocation. It's not a vocation for somebody, and and they don't really understand it. There's a, there's a school, a high school in Texas. I forget the little name of the town, but the coach – teaches all his kids to be respectful. And he has a he has a day where he has a protocol day where he teaches the kids how to open a door for women, how to be polite to ladies. Uh, he, and he actually says, uh, you, have to, you have to understand that the umpire is not going to be right all the time, but you have to respect his authority because he's the only authority of baseball out there. And he actually coaches his kids to be respectful. And I'll never forget my first spring training ever in Major League Baseball. Well, one Major League Baseball, it, it was the Detroit Tigers camp. And uh, Steve Ripley, it was like his first plate job ever in a professional game. And this kid from the Tigers struck out and he set his uniform on fire. And so I came in from first base and I was screaming at him. And Mike Fitzpatrick, the third base umpire, came in. He was screaming. So now the everything's over and the game ends and we're walking back to the, to the, uh, the, not the stadium, but the barracks where we stayed at Tiger town, the old barracks and Ed Catalanis, who was the head of the camp called every Detroit tiger to the tower. And you remember the towers where you had the tower in the middle, and you had four fields going out by the sides. 
And he started lecturing them on the loudspeaker that uh, you boys are here to try to get a job. Those umpires already have one. And if there's going to be any argument, that's your manager's job. It is not yours. And uh, after that, Steve Ripley was walking on air. He thought it was the greatest thing in the world. But uh, it's, it's hard. And the protocol, when you're into the game and excited to try to do the very best you can, and you feel like the umpire made a mistake, it's hard to hold your emotions. And uh, that's something that you have to learn. I mean, it's hard for young umpires to hold their emotions where they think they're right and they think the player's wrong. So it's, it's a learning process. I'll never forget the best piece of advice I ever got was from an old umpire named Doug Harvey. And uh, he said, don't let them ruin your day. He said, you're doing a good job. And in your worst day, your percentages are going to be better than the players at what you're doing. He said, so if they do something to get out of line, you kick them out. And if they do, <laughs> he said, don't, don't put up with it. He said, but don't let them ruin day, your day. Don't, don't get mad. And that was the greatest piece of advice I ever got. And uh, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, an umpire, no matter if he's in little league or Babe Ruth league or college or in the big leagues, he has three responsibilities and his first responsibilities to the game of baseball itself. Now, that might not mean the commissioner's office, but the game itself. The second responsibility is to the umpiring profession. And that doesn't necessarily mean the umpire's union or the guys you're working with. And your third responsibility is do what you know is morally honest and correct in your heart. And if you do those three things in that order, nothing you do will be wrong. Well, unless you kick Mark Burley out of the game, then your partners will hate you, but. <laughs> well, so, most- so I clearly did not come up with the Tigers because I was not taught that about umpires. I was taught they all suck and they're all wrong all the time. So it's okay. Yeah. Of course what's you didn't the, come up with the Tigers. <laughs> what's the worst or the best? I want the best ejection story slash worst story you ever had. You threw out, I don't know how many, you threw out hundreds, I'm sure hundreds of guys. What's the best uh, 100, story you 196. have? 196. 196? 196. Okay. 196. What's your best story? I, I want to hear Joe West's best story. <laughs> well, uh, my best my best story would be about a, a situation from a golf tournament. And this is from an old ball player named Ryan Klesko. You remember him? I do. Oh, yeah. Of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we invited Ryan Klesko to the Country Golf Classic at Doral Country Club. And uh, – it was a classic because we had Mickey Gilly, we had Box Carl Willie, we had Rick Serrate from White Snake, you know, we had Charlie Harrison from Wings, we had Les Dudak from the Almond Brothers, and it was a great golf tournament. They had a they actually had a band the night before. Anyway, and, and Plesco's running around to all these famous people getting getting them to autograph his hat. So the baseball season comes about and then at the end of the year, I get this phone call, and I don't recognize the numbers. For some reason, I picked it up, and he says, uh, he says, Joe, yeah, Ryan Klesko. Oh, how you doing? He says, uh, I want to take you pheasant hunting. I said, you want to take me pheasant hunting? That's cool. I've never been pheasant hunting. I've been duck hunting, deer hunting, bear hunting, uh, fe- uh, but I've never been pheasant hunting. He says, yeah, there's about 12 of us going to go. I got this place outside of Atlanta. And I said, uh, wait a minute. What 12? And he named off 12 major league ball players. I said, let me get this straight. You want me to walk out in the open field with 12 ball players with shotguns? Have you lost your mind? <laughs> <laughs> I was one of them, by the way. I was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some of the some of these ejections are hilarious. Some of them are bad. Some of them, uh, it's just uh, you have to kick them out because – what they did is not conducive to, like we said, the spirit of the game, and you have to protect the game first. Um, I've, I had to kick I, I kicked out Terry Collins one time because his face was cut in a fight, and he says, I can't go back to the dugout with this kid, and he kicked me out. Sure, gone. But uh, <laughs> And then uh, Don Zimmer, he used to get kicked out. Uh Bobby Cox, I threw Bobby Cox out for throwing a batting helmet in the middle of the infield in a World Series game. Um, I thought the, the 
the player that just struck out through it. So I find him it was Blauser. And, uh, and the entire Atlanta bench said, he didn't do it. He didn't do it. I said, okay, who did it? And Bobby Cox stood up and said, I did it. I said, okay, you're done. <laughs> so I got kicked out. <laughs> hey, but, uh, yeah. Joe, so so the fan questions all have like a similar theme here. They said, like Ben Carr goes, what player gave you the most grief through the years? Billy O'Brien, which player and manager did you have the biggest beef with during the game? Ree Riley, who got under your skin the most times where you turned red? Um, was it a player or coach? So all pretty much the same question. Like, was there – Public enemy number one over your years um, for player on the field that just was all over you or, or making fun of you, you know, maybe trying to pick on on the singing career, whatever. And same thing with a manager that was always getting after you. We're like, all right, this guy's got no chance with me today. Well, you you forget they they don't have the last word. One of the funniest lines Steve Garvey ever told me. I was yelling at Joe Torrey for about five minutes. And when I got back to first base, Garvey put his glove over his face and he says, you know, you have the last word, whether you take it or not, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> but uh, managers, uh, I had Earl Weaver in two games, spring training games. He never finished either one of them. <laughs> so Earl Weaver's never finished the game I was in. And, <laughs> and yet, if you got Earl Weaver on a golf course, he's one of the most pleasant people in the world to play with. We actually invited him to that golf tournament. The round, he was one of the best celebrities you could have there because he spoke with everybody, and he would sign autographs. He'd sign autographs for anybody, and he was he was a great baseball ambassador. Now, I, I'll give you another one, Tommy Lasorda. But if you barked at Tommy Lasorda, he'd back down. He'd back off. If you barked at Earl Weaver, he'd come out there like a mad dog. Uh, Dick Williams was tough. Dick Williams is tough to deal with. He told us one day at home plate, he said, you know, if uh, I don't care what you call out there, if it goes against me, I'm coming out there. Well, about the third inning, we had an obstruction play. His, his third baseman didn't get out of the way of the runner in the rundown. He ran right into him, so we called obstruction. Put him on. Here he came. Before he could get to the dirt in the infield, I said, well, you said you were coming out here, and then he called me every expletive in the book, and so I had to throw it. Man. But um, – you know who was who else was tough on young umpires was Chuck Tanner, and uh, one of the younger umpires told me one day he said, "You know, he picks on every young umpire that comes up here until you show him that you're not going to listen to it anymore." And and after you would show Chuck where your limit was, he was very good. He was one of the nicest people that you'd ever want to meet. I, and of course, he's probably before both your all your all three of your guys' time in the big leagues, but. Uh, he he was uh, he was quite the manager, and uh, ball players. Uh, yeah, the uh, we had a ball player named Milton Bradley one time. Yeah, he, pl he played. Mm -hmm. for, I remember him with the Dodgers, and uh, he'd gotten kicked out about four times that year. And uh, Peter Gammons made a statement to the press that we were baiting him. And so I called Peter Gammons. I said, Peter, you can't bait him. If he was a fish, he'd jump in the boat. <laughs> 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 and uh, I mean, he, he, he was that uh, high strung, uh, you know, uh, Adrian Beltre. He used to, he used to complain about every pitch, but he was kidding. You know, he'd be at third base and the ball would bounce and he'd say, that ball looks like a strike. And then he'd be batting the ball. would be right down the middle. You call it a strike. He said, that's outside. But he was kidding. <laughs> you know, he would say, it didn't matter what you called. It was quite the opposite. And one day I told him, I said, you know, you're a very good ball player, but you are a horse shit umpire. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. I love it. Well, Joe, last thing that I want to bounce off you. Um, automated balls and strikes i think it's going to happen at some point pretty soon that's like the next wave here whether it's like challenges or it's just full-on balls and strikes being called which obviously changes the role of the home plate um significantly oh, yeah. do you think the umpires i mean your your friends that you worked with for years will be pissed about that happy about that because it seems like umps eventually were pretty pleased with you say instant replay review it takes a little heat off of them and they could be like look i was right or look i don't have to be 
wrong and cost someone a game. Balls and strikes is is a lot. So what what do you think about it? But also, do you think the umps are like talking about this and like, yeah, sure, that's great, take it off our plate, or they're going, eh, hold on, relax, that's too far. I think the biggest problem with with that, I'll get to that in a minute, but I got to tell you about putting instant replay in. When we first put in instant replay, we had half the umpires didn't want it. And we had to explain to them that the replay guy that's changing this call is your fifth umpire on the field. He's trying to help you, keep you from making a mistake. He's not trying to belittle you for the call you made because you made the call from your heart when you were on the field. So you got to look at it like he's helping you. He's your extra set of eyes. And it's worked very well. In fact, when we first put in replay, we thought ejections would go down by half. They went up by 10%. And you know why? Because the managers would come out and argue with the replay. So we kicked out a bunch of managers because they argued with the replay. Now, the robotic umpire behind the plate we're graded on one of those things we're graded it was originally called quest tech and now it's the zone evaluation and we actually took baseball to court and we beat them in court because we proved it wasn't as completely accurate as they say it is but the point being that using that system they grade every umpire on every plate job that he does now the last two years that i worked we didn't have one umpire who graded under 95% behind the plate. So he's the worst umpire we had was missing five, 5% five of his pitches. <clears throat> They've yet <clears throat> to get this machine to miss less than 7%. So what do we do with the pitches that the machine misses? That's what the problem is. You see, you understand what I'm saying? And, and when an umpire misses the pitch, he calls ball or strike, he calls something. But when that machine misses a pitch, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't track it. And one day I'm working with Andy Fletcher. And Andy had a good game the night before, and he came to me. And, of course, these young guys, they live and die over that machine, how it grades. And he said, the machine said I missed six pitches. I said, well, I, I was working at second base. I couldn't see a pitch I could even question. He said, yeah, that said I missed six pitches. I said, well, how many did the machine miss? He said, oh, it didn't track 14. I said, so let me get this straight. We're going to use a machine to call balls and strikes that misses twice as many pitches as you do? <laughs> so <laughs> so they, they don't want it then, right? I mean, I would oh, guess no, that... I, I think that oh, the umpires... Uh, yeah. The umpires don't want it in, in that form. I, I'm sure they would, they would bend a little bit if you said, uh, uh, okay, we'll call the pitches it doesn't track. But if you think there's pressure on a 3-2 pitch now, Let's put that machine in place. And now the three, two pitch, the machine doesn't call anything. How much pressure is there now? Hmm. That's magnified 10 times. Does, it, does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying there? Yeah, but I, I think, and they keep updating the tech and you're right. They still haven't gotten it completely straightened out, but I do think it always makes a call. I just think it's still figuring out how to cover everyone's zone. I just want to know who the umpire was. It was the worst. Can you? Can we get like initials? Was it like <laughs> CB? You know, well, you know, uh, here's here's a funny thing. the The guy that had our worst rating was uh, president of the union before me. His name was John Hirschbeck. Oh, and yet, oh, I can give you some great John Hirschbeck stories. And yet, that. whoa, baby. And yet, when you put him in the playoff game, he was almost perfect. Yeah, him and Mark. Him and his brother. His brother, his, I worked with his brother, yeah. But Oof. when he was in the regular season, his strike zone was great big. And when he got in the playoffs, he called – he had one of the, the better strike zones ever in the playoffs. He was and, like an uh, NBA player. He's chilling during the regular season. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, it's like Robert Ory, right? Yeah. I'll chill during the regular season. I'm just going to drill threes and no one's going to – say anything's wrong with my strike zone that's that's interesting he he was hyper you had to get him to focus that's the thing you guys are human beings it's like you had to go to him to Hirschbeck I need you to focus well and plus there's going to be a lot more scrutiny on his games in the playoffs than there are a game in uh say Tampa Bay in in April you know and that and that's uh that's really uh 
what it amounts to, you, your, your concentration is the biggest thing when you're working home plate. And uh, I tell people all the time, you know, uh, probably the, the catcher that changed the way all you guys catch today was bench. Because when bench came to the big leagues, uh, all the catchers had that little round circle in that big pad. And bench wouldn't use that glove. He, he had a, a hinge in the bottom of his cor uh, corner of the glove. And he'd catch the ball out in front of him. And he had to catch it out in front of him because he had a size eight head and his shoulders are so broad. So if he didn't catch the ball out in front of him, you couldn't see it. And so I think he, he's the one that really revolutionized how you catch the ball, what they call framing today. But, uh, he, and he was quite the ball player. I'll never, I'll never forget. He was, he was catching one day in Houston and this guy was yelling at me from the third row. And he was yelling from the first pitch of the game. And about the fifth inning, he yelled and he lost his voice. His voice cracked. Bench turned around and said, you finally got him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe, we're going to let you go. But before I let you go, before actually I'm going to kick your ass off the show because you kicked me out of that spring training game that one time. <laughs> but I used to say, what you said about John Hirschbeck, I used to say about you, you were horse shit in the regular season. But there were times when you wanted to be a good umpire, you were a good umpire. So get the hell out of here. Go home. And by the way, if you could try on the shirt behind you over your right shoulder, the pink one, I think you would look great in it. The pink one? Yeah, the pink that's, one over your right shoulder. Yeah. Pink, yeah, look, you look what, over your shoulder, there's a pink one that would fit perfectly. Yeah, that's my wife's shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. Awesome, awesome. Joe, get out of here. Thank You're gone. You, Joe. It was awesome. Take care. It was great to see you guys. Nice, Joe. You too. You too.